Camp opens on Thursday, folks. We've made it to the end of the offseason. I've been saying it a lot, and it's because I'm really happy that we have. Speculation season is almost over, but not quite. We're going to do some of that today. It's still time to project a little bit. We're going to get ready for camp all week long on the podcast daily. This is Monday. That's Bill Landis, Jeremy Birmingham. I'm Austin Ward. Let's go under the radar. Thursday morning, you get out there to the Woody Hayes Athletic Center, Bill. Who is somebody... Mm -hmm. That's going to begin the journey. It's going to have your attention, and they might be more important to the Buckeyes than we thought. Uh, I'm gonna. Uh, I do want to talk about the offensive line in this episode, but I won't. I won't do it first. Um, oh come on! <laughs> no, play the hits. I, I, yeah, I should play the hits. You're right. Um, I I'd probably go to the receivers. I know Ryan Day was asked at Big Ten Media Days about the receiver depth, and then like he rattled off a bunch of names, but then also made it sound like they kind of knew who their top four was. So so I don't know. I, I, I'm not I'm not entirely sure how that's going to play out in terms of like how deep th that rotation might go. I look forward to talking to Brian Hartline at some point um, during camp to get, to get a better idea of that. But I am pretty interested in Bryson Rogers based off what we saw in the spring. So I, I don't know if he qualifies as, as under the radar, but but his name was like not among the top four. I think that Ryan Day kind of talked about him. We know that who they are, Mecca Abuka, Carnell Tate, Jeremiah Smith, and, and I think Brandon Innes. Uh, and then Brent, or Bryson Rogers was kind of in that group with, you know, Kojo Antwi and Jaden Ballard as, as guys. And it feels like Ryan Day and Brian Hartline and Chip Kelly are probably looking maybe to, to show a little bit of a spark during camp to, to kind of force the issue and, and, give them some peace of mind one about the depth of the depth of the position but also um probably something more than that like show a little playmaking potential somebody that can really help the offense this year not not merely um provide depth so when i look at that remaining group without knowing really what mylon graham might offer as a, as a freshman um i i think bryson rogers is the guy there that interests me the most or maybe has the most upside um you know he that definitely popped a few times in the spring, we've talked about that one play where we, we saw where he kind of caught a slant or a hitch, whatever it was, and then split a couple of defenders and ran for a long touchdown. Like he just he just appears to have a lot of juice to his game and, and seems pretty smooth. So it's it's always hard to to fight your way onto the field when you're not kind of at the top of that receiver pecking order at Ohio State. But um, I, I don't think Ohio State would have welcomed Bryson Rogers back after initially trying to transfer if they didn't think he had. Uh, a lot of potential so i'm i'm interested to see what that looks like when they get the pads back on and, and start playing football again because he, he does feel to me like somebody who might be able to make a move it seems to me like he might be in a little bit uh, of that like nebulous middle zone because he's not a guy that ryan day mentioned as you said is like the first four and he did seem to include brandon innes in that but he also wasn't a guy that ryan day was like we need to see more from he wasn't, you know, like Jaden Ballard. He specifically was like, we need to see more from Jaden Ballard. Kojo Antwi, we need to see more. Like in that, in the middle ground there, you have what you hope you get out of Bryson Rogers, which is a guy that steps up and, and fills the role and challenges. But I think he's good enough to be the fifth guy. And I think he's good enough to be the fourth guy, to be honest. So, I mean, I, I do think that um, the distinction and how he was talked about, I think is telling and, and worthwhile. Uh, but definitely a guy that you have to be looking at. I mean, if, if Ohio State's going to go a long way, you're going to need some wide receiver depth, and he has to be the guy. Yeah, that's kind of funny that you don't. It's better to not be mentioned at all because it's like, <laughs> well, you're not being uh, prodded to give more, and it, clearly you're not in the top four. Well, maybe not clearly. I guess we'll find out uh, on Thursday where that shakes out. But we expect Brandon Ennis would be. Uh, number four there, along with Carnell Tate, Jeremiah Smith, and Emeka Ibuka. But like, that's sort of sort of the sweet spot. I, I think that that means rather that he's being dismissed, like you're saying, Berm, like he, that, that they know that they could get something out of him. And being number five uh, is probably, the, the and not being mentioned by name, is probably better than the alternative in this case. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. You know who, uh, if I can pick a guy that's on, I don't know if a fifth year senior who is the only returning starter at his position is under the radar. But when you talk about the players on this defense, and I think maybe we haven't talked about Cody Simon enough as far as how the team responds to Cody Simon. Like, you know, there was a lot of discussion in the last two years about the linebacker play and whether or not Tommy Eichenberg and Steel Chambers were good enough to be playing as much as they did. And like I think there's a lot of fair questions about their overall talent level or athleticism, whatever. I mean, obviously, Tommy was drafted in the fifth round, and that's pretty good. I mean, let's be honest. There's not a lot of guys getting drafted to play in the NFL. 
So like that, that is something, but the leadership that he had on display all the time, the way the guys responded to him was never a question. And, and as we talked to uh, the guys in Indianapolis last week, that was just something that stuck with me, the way that they are like revere Cody Simon. And, and I think maybe he was being glossed over a little bit. Um, and there's a lot of questions a linebacker around him and who's going to step up and, and actually compliment him in that position. But I'm really interested to see if he is the vocal leader of the of that defense because there's so many guys coming back, but they all are in their own ways pretty reclusive. Um, and Cody is quiet, but he's never been shy. And, I, and I'm interested to see how he takes this defense and leads it because it, they need somebody to step up and fill the leadership vacuum that is left by Kate Stover leaving, by Tommy Eichenberg leaving, by Steel Chambers leaving. And, and I don't know that anyone... Um, outside of Jack Sawyer, uh, who is very vocal, has really emerged to, to be like the team, like stand in front of the team and yell at people type of guy. And I, and I think Cody might have that opportunity. Now, that's not to say like guys like Denzel Burke or Lathan Ransom haven't taken on some leadership qualities and, and taken on pieces of things, but who's the guy that's going to stand up in front of everyone? Remember last year when Emeka Ibuka grabbed everyone and said that this is not good enough? Like, who's yep. going to be that mm-hmm. guy? And I think Cody Simon has to be. Bill, I think somebody out there hasn't been glossing over Cody Simon this offseason. I'm trying to think who that would be. <laughs> yeah. I, Emeka, I, Emeka I think no, in general, me. I've been talking yeah. about Cody Simon all yeah. offseason. You've, but are you've we talking about how important he George. is? Yeah. I think we I have. am. I think we've given him the proper, proper due. Yeah. Okay. But if you Austin, want more, that's Austin fine. definitely has. Now, that's honestly, I just, ever I, I turn off every time Austin talks, so it's, I may not have even heard it. It's fair. I can't really blame you for that. Everybody else does too. Um, I don't disagree with anything you said. I've, the leadership point is, um, I think probably becoming more prevalent as guys like Denzel Burke and Ameka Ibuka and others are, are speaking about out about that more publicly. I've tried to take the tack that, He's probably not getting a, enough acclaim for the work that he's done on the field that I think some opinions of his play solidified during year one when he was a starter and playing through a shoulder injury and missed some tackles and at the end of the year just clearly wasn't himself before uh, undergoing that surgery. And then he's had to uh, like essentially start back over and rebuild himself up. The what For whatever grains of salt you need to add to the PFF numbers or even just the raw tackle totals per snap, like, all those are much better and improved every single year, which is what you'd expect. He just had the highest volume of snaps in year one when physically he wasn't able to withstand that. Everyone gets stronger, more mature, uh, better understanding of a defensive system the longer they're in it. And so Cody Simon is in year three of, with Jim Knowles playing at linebacker and now James Laurinaitis, a, a second year working with him as a position coach. Um, he's, he's played in a lot of football games. Um, and I think that I think we're going to see something pretty special out of Cody Simon this year, and uh, I'm willing to go out on that limb. I think it's pretty sturdy. Did Berm steal your guy, or did you have another one of mine for an, for an under the radar? Dude, the uh, I was going to say I was going to start with Patrick Gerd because oh, I oh, now that is all, under-radar. and I because I, I never remember to mention him, and I think he's going to be pretty <laughs> important. There's a a thing, Bill, last week where or I guess several times throughout the summer where Ryan Day has talked about Chip Kelly and their uh, philosophies after parting ways and then coming back together, the things that Chip Kelly did at UCLA. And the thing that he's mentioned the most, he's like, Chip did a lot of things with like three tight ends that I think are pretty interesting. And I don't know if Ohio State is going to do that a ton. I don't know if they're going to do it at all. But we've, you and I have had some conversations about what the tight end depth looks like how much they're going to play, how they can get to some of those looks, especially 12 personnel. But even if you're talking 13, I think the guy who may be best equipped in some ways to handle that role would be Patrick Gerd. And I, I always leave him out of the conversation and I, I shouldn't. So he's under the radar. He's under my radar. I'm trying to make sure that he gets back out there and that I maybe pay more attention on Thursday and Friday to where he is and it's when the split squad stuff's out there. Like, I don't know if we'll have a good feel for that, but mm-hmm. again, I go back to what was the first play in the spring game and who was out there. 
I think he definitely has the best chance to be like the that blocking back type out of out of that room, assuming that they try to utilize that role some. And I believe they will. Um, I don't know how, how much of an uptick there was from like 11 and or 10 personnel, say like at Oregon or the NFL to, to bigger personnel packages at UCLA. I, I think like anecdotally, I clearly was, it was evident that Chip did play with some bigger personnel packages. I, I do wonder how much of that was because like that's just sort of what he had on hand or that's because mm-hmm. of what he wanted to do. So that's probably a good question for him the next time we, we talk to him. Um, but regardless, like they're, they're going to play with a lot of different personnel packages. I think, I, I think that like if Chip has the ability to do that, he'll want to, which then calls the tight ends into play, even if it's not a, um, you know, a, a regular thing to be lining up with, with 13 personnel, but, but Packer, like I, it's a different kind of skill set in that room, which is like the same thing that got Mitch Rossi on the field. Um, so I, I could definitely see it. I don't really think he's front of mind for many people because, we're all sort of wondering still, I think, who's going to be the number one tight end for this team, and like about Jelani Thurman. And when there's a lot of that discussion in other places, a guy like Pat Gerd, who was not a scholarship player out of Ohio State when he started out here, just like sort of by his nature flies under the radar. But but I, I can definitely see him playing a big role for the offense this year because Chip, Chip likes to like get guys in space and, and use those guys as blockers. And Maybe that can be G. Scott or Will Kasmarek or whoever out of that room, but but I, I'm certainly not writing uh, Packer off when I'm trying to think of who could do those things. Is he on scholarship now? I don't. Remember I don't know. That, I don't yeah, remember seeing that sure. happen. And I think that's the concern. Like it, you know, I like the pick, but I I shudder to think about what that means for Jelani Thurman and what it means for Bennett Christian and their development. If you're getting to a situation where the third tight end who spends any consistent amount of time on the field is Patrick Gerd and not one of those two. And that that is a scary thought, I think, for the you know, the people who are wondering if Keenan Bailey is able to get the best out of the tight end group. Yeah. I mean that could be true. And at the same time, it could be like Mitch Rossi is the perfect example of that, of someone who is a veteran who has good athleticism, started as a walk on and then carved out a role. Like the, the difference between those two is four years of college and four years in the weight room for Patrick Gerd compared to Jelani Thurman. I, I'm not saying that he's going to yeah. play more than Jelani Thurman. To your point, that would be problematic. I think it would be it's it could be another success story that yeah. this guy kept plugging away. You have a, a mature, physically developed guy who who accepts a role and plays it. Like, is he gonna ever be the red zone threat that Jelani Thurman is? Of of course not. I'm not suggesting he is, but I, I think to what Bill's saying, like there when there is that much attention on how is it going to work with those top three guys, there's going to be a fourth on the field who has to do something that is a little bit different. No, and clearly the, the players have a lot of respect for him and he's earned the trust of the coach staff. He is different than Rossi, who was like six foot two and 230 pounds, in that he's almost six five, two fifty. Like he looks more like a traditional inline tight end than a guy that you put in the backfield and, and do a little stuff with, but he is athletic enough to do that. And it, you know his dad played at Ohio State. Like there's a there's a lot to like about Patrick Hurd and and what he's done for Ohio State. I just I I'm afraid of the reaction from America. That's all. <laughs> Fair. It's always it's sometimes always yeah always good to be worried about that. I think just sort yeah. of generally yeah. All right, Bill. Who's your second pick? Uh, all right, I'll go to the offensive line now and um, pro- Probably a bit of a, a swerve from the more pressing issue on the offensive line, which is figuring out right guard. I have found myself wondering um, what the 2025 tackle situation is going to look like with all the David Sanders conversation that's, that's currently happened on the recruiting trail. And I want to spend a decent amount of time, if I can, in these open practices, like seeing how George Fitzpatrick yes. has come along. How I did it? I did it. Did you see me yeah. mind mind melding? I know you could probably put Zen Mahalski in that in that conversation as well, but Zen's a year older and has kind of had some cracks at it already and, and hasn't really broken through. Um, I think George George Fitzpatrick, excuse me, probably stands a better chance to do that maybe than, than Zen Mahalski does. I wonder too if if we're in the world where Ryan Day seemed to suggest that right guard is probably going to come down the Carson Hinsman or Tegger Shabola. Then did they give Luke Montgomery another like a longer look at tackle in camp? Um, because I, th- I still think he's a guy that can kind of end up anywhere on the offensive line, and they they need tackle depth. And I understand like you could move pieces around, like Tegger can play tackle if you need him to, and Donovan Jackson could probably play tackle if if you needed him to. But if you're talking just like pure two deep, I'd, I'd imagine the second tackles are 
or George Fitzpatrick and Zeb Mohowski, maybe Ian Moore, you know, makes that interesting. I think he could given his recruiting pedigree, but George is always a guy that I've, I've been intrigued by given his athletic background. And I think we all sort of knew it was going to be a multi-year process for him to be truly ready to contribute um, because he was uh, not undersized. He was tall enough and long enough. He just didn't need to the game late. And he's done that. And now he's, he's played tackle. I think going back to high school now, he should have like about four years of tackle playing under his belt or, of, yeah tackle playing under his belt so i think he should be ready to start pushing for for playing time and, and i'd like to see that and there's been times in the spring where i've i've watched a couple of reps of george fitzpatrick and thought to myself like man that looks really good um and some others where it's like man like that guy's still trying to figure some things out which is which is okay but um a, a strong camp from him i think would mean a whole heck of a lot for ohio state and even if it has almost nothing to do with the 2024 offensive line uh, or at least the starting five uh, you will you want to see that depth i think at that position in particular start to kind of shine through um and then maybe he can position himself to be in that conversation in 2025 so just, like tackle depth in general is on my mind but more specifically like what can george fitzpatrick do th this august hmm. yeah That's i might hold that i might yeah, i was thinking i was like i knew i was trying to get you to talk about george fitzpatrick <laughs> i thought i was just giving you a migraine as i talk so i'm glad <laughs> i'm glad you were no i crushed figuring it that out Okay. He was trying to be Karnak over there. I think that's yeah. a great point because we do talk a lot about Josh Simmons and Josh Fryer and like nothing else about what might happen if they need to get somebody else to go in there. We have talked also about Ohio State's good fortune with injury health, and you can knock on wood if you're an Ohio State fan or you're Justin Fry, but um, you're you're always a play away, and I don't I don't really have a great feel bill for what that would look like at tackle right now. Yeah, I, I have I have no idea who their next tackle is. Uh, my second guy uh, is inspired by NCAA football 2025. <laughs> um, so, but also, you know, at least initially on spring football conversations that Larry Johnson had with the media and Jason Moore. Um, so, in, in my first uh, simulation of NCAA football 2025, as a season with Ohio State, Jason Moore uh, won the Bednarik Award. Uh, what had twenty had twenty two sacks? What and let's go! I, I don't know what happened. I mean, it, we're it, advancing the agenda. I love it. So like he <laughs> just he just absolutely dominated. I, I I mean you can't change player ratings or anything. So I don't know how it happened, but he had twenty two sacks uh, for Ohio State and won the Bednarik and was the. Uh, best player on the defense so now i don't anticipate that happening for ohio state this summer uh or, or you know once fall practice starts but i do think that he has a role to play and we talk so much about hero canoe and caden mcdonald and even taiwan malone and what's the role for him but the the way that the coaches talked about jason moore and the words that were used about him and then his own self-assessment like it's scary when i'm out there like <laughs> i, I want to see that <laughs> um, I want to see the I want to see the guy who scares himself. So let's uh, let's let it cut loose and and see what he can be. Because six foot six, three hundred five pounds, like that's not normal uh, at defensive tackle. And you're talking like a Chris Jones, you know, type for the Kansas City Chiefs, like that potential with that length and that sort of uh, size in the middle. So um, Jason Moore is probably not going to have twenty two sacks this year, but I think he can be a real pain in the ass for for offenses around the country. That would be pretty wild if he Dude, like I was blown away. I was like, what in the world? I was like, I checked the stats halfway through the season and he had like 14. I was like, oh, what in the piss? And then like <laughs> <laughs> and it just kept going. It was nuts. So you were just straight simulating it? You weren't actually playing? Yeah, with yeah him straight, straight simulation. I, I was trying to learn how to do recruiting stuff, so I didn't play any of the games and was just recruiting. Uh, but then I just was looking, and I was like, what in the world? Hmm. Can, okay. can the headline for this episode be, will Jason Moore be in Dominican Sioux? Or is that too much? <laughs> is that putting too fine a point on it? Well, the SEO doesn't like when we use questions in the headline. So no. Oh, okay. So it will be, Jason Moore is the next in Dominican Sioux. Yeah. By the way, the quote from Jason Moore in the spring was describing himself. It's kind of unreal. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, 22 sacks and it is kind of unreal. So it is. Yeah. I'd like to see. Well, see, but that actually isn't real. Jason Moore practicing and dominating that. That's not a video game. That's real life. Okay. So over under 
that Jason Moore has one tenth of that total of sacks. So two point five. Does Jason Moore have over or under two point five on the season? I think he'll. I think he'll have over two and a half sacks. Yeah, I'll say over. Now, Caden McDonald will have twenty two. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm I, I'm comfortable predicting that as a pair they have twenty four for sure. <laughs> mm-hmm. now, that's that's real life. Um, I I was trying to think if this would even count, but I'm going to try and get it there. I think Malik Hartford just seems like because of the injury in spring and the way that he tapered off towards the end of the freshman year is all it's almost been like out of sight and out of mind with him and that's i think off base so i i I feel like he went from bursting onto the radar at the start of training camp a year ago and playing early in september and then vanished off of it entirely this off season and he's i think a healthy version of him pretty critical here when you're looking at the next safety in line behind caleb downs and lathan ransom and Again, it, it is not a problem if a true freshman has growing pains, and and he did late in the year. And uh, if things had been different, maybe uh, on the play that he was on the field in the game, if if Lathan Ransom is out there, you know, maybe it's a different conversation. And we don't even add that into, uh, I think, some of the cooling disappointment that there is in Malik, Malik Hartford. But if that was something that was slowing him down as well, a health concern that required surgery. You know, I think that can also put that in a different context than just, well, as a true freshman and growing pain. So maybe the, both of those things can be true. And if they are, he's got some of that extra uh, year of experience, a taste of it, uh, a time to get fully healthy, a time to get stronger in the weight room. Um, and we've, we've said that Jaden Bonsu had a good spring. We've, you know, Jalen McClain, the, the upside is there. People have been talking about him in the summer. But the guy who I think would right, be right there, Bill, um, would be Malik Hartford. And we haven't spent a great deal of time talking about him over the last few months. He's incredibly important. Um, and it is funny to think about what what might have been for him or how people would think about him had he just kind of like turned his head around <laughs> against Michigan because yeah. he was because he was like he was in the right spot. He just yeah. like looked looked in the wrong looked in the wrong direction for some reason. And I've always thought it was funny that JJ McCarthy said like, oh yeah, we watched the film and knew that he was going to turn his head. It's like, uh-huh. I think he just got, I think he just got lucky because <laughs> I've seen the videos of JJ throwing the ball in NFL training camp. I don't think he's that discerning of a quarterback. I think he threw a ball in a position that was primed to be intercepted by Malik Harford. Had Malik Harford just sort of had his eyes forward or had his eyes on the quarterback. So it's, it's on, on the one play that, yeah, that he played yeah. in that game. Right, right. So it's unfortunate that it broke that way for him, but I, I also I still the think play, it's going to be awesome for this defense. The yeah, play sorry, did guys. still end. Yeah, but I was I just wanted to add that for JJ McCarthy to revise history here, that play still did end in an interception, even if the officials didn't agree. Oh, true. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, my second player was going to be Keenan Nelson Jr. for a very similar reason as what you picked, Malik Hartford. Because I'm I'm exceedingly curious about the safety depth and what happens after Lathan Ransom and Caleb Downs. And Keenan Nelson was added late in the transfer portal, has been really not talked about at all. And I think he is being expected to be just a, a warm body, basically on special teams. But I want to see how he looks out there at, at Ohio State. I mean, he's I, I, I just have this feeling he's going to play more than we maybe anticipate heading into this year. Um, and whether that is special teams, whether it's on defense when games are maybe out of hand, I don't know. But uh, I, I think that safety depth is so, so not discussed and needs to be. Yeah. yeah. Bill, do you have anybody else you want to include? Uh, I've talked about Austin Saravelt a lot, so I, I don't need to rehash that. But I, there is not a whole lot of opportunity, I think, for anyone sort of anywhere on this roster to surprisingly throw themselves into a competition to be a starter. And obviously, since like right guard is open, that would probably be the 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 best spot or for that potentially to happen. And it just seems like people like what Austin's doing. So um, I don't like. I'm not saying like watch out for Austin Cerebral. He's going to surprise everybody and win the starting right guard job. But I don't think I'd be floored if he made it interesting, just because people seem to really like what he's putting out there when when they're practicing. So we'll see. Let me quick fire here for you guys. Uh, which quarterback are you watching most intently as we get out there? This week, Will Howard. I think it has to be Will Howard just to compare what it looks like to what we saw uh, in those five practices that were open in the spring. 
I'm really ho- looking to see like a jump from Lincoln Keenholz if he made one from the mm-hmm. sump from the spring to now, like physically and just accuracy wise. Um, defensive end. Who are you watching? Katie Justin Curry. Bourne. <laughs> <laughs> Another EA Sports joke. Uh, Edric, Edric Houston has to be the guy. He's he's I, fascinating. I I I can I can get behind that as well. But for Caden, aren't aren't we sort of tiptoeing up to the make or break point in the Ohio State career? I mean that's that's two full years already under his belt, and then another off season. Um, doesn't mean that anyone can't still make a, a senior jump, but this junior year seems pretty critical for him. It just seems so unfortunate that I mean not in a bad way for Ohio State, but you, you, there was no expectation that Jack and JT were going to still be here heading into this year until last, no, last November. And then it even became a possibility. So like for, for both Caden and Kenyatta Jackson, like you're like, Oh my gosh, dude, like, dude, now I gotta, now I gotta wait again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I, you know, and as I think about it from this perspective, as good as both Jack and JT are, and they're not just good, they're great. Like, the Kenyatta Jackson and Caden Curry both could change the conversation about the rotation if they got out in games and like made a splashier impact. Like f- if they force the issue and it's like, you know what, you don't have to go to Notre Dame, and these are the only two guys that you can count on in key situations. And I, that just that hasn't happened to this point in their career yet. And as we we make this point all the time, it doesn't mean that it can't or that it's a, a problem or an indictment for younger players that they're not able to push their way into it, but. Like Kenyatta Jackson and Caden Curry have the physical tools to be right there in that conversation for playing time. I'm not saying that they have to have a four way split for snaps like it's the, you know, 2017, 2018 defensive line for Ohio State, but it's it sure be great for all of them if they could do that. It would be. Can I, uh, can I tweak the defensive end question and say like Arvell Reese? And you can tweak like anything you want here, Bill. Love that. I'll say I'll say Arvell if he gets any action on the line of scrimmage like he was last game. All I want to see is Arvell and Sonny and CJ on the field at the same time. <laughs> All right. Cut that clip. Save it. That'll just be the new theme for the show throughout the month of August. Uh, we have we're excited here. Uh, the podcast daily is ready for the start of training camp. We hope that you are too. We, we're going to guess that you are uh, will be out there for those practices and every one that the Buckeyes have open. What do you got, Berm? Uh, should, we inf- should we inform people uh, of the Roosters change? I was going this week? to, yeah. Cool. Yeah. I just want to make sure. Uh... Roosters, <laughs> a, a, which is a fun casual joint. Uh, we will be in the Horseshoe Lounge on Tuesday this week. There are some you know, scheduling things we're working out, and it'll be one day closer to the first practice, which will make it even better. So that won't be coming later on today, which is Monday, uh, but it will still happen this week. There will still be coverage of every practice that is available to us and every media availability that is scheduled throughout the month of August, which is rapidly approaching, and we are pumped for it. Uh, I, I know I can speak for Bill Landis and Jeremy Birmingham when I say that. I'm Austin Ward, and this has been the Podcast Daily for Monday. So long.